Hello, my name is Sai. I'm an associate lecturer at the University of the Arts London. Today, I would like to share with you a project exploring possibilities of teaching practice-based postgraduate art and design via emails. So let's get started. When I first started teaching, I hear my colleagues complaining about students who read their emails. With my intuition and my experience working communication design and brand strategy, I find this statement tickled my fancy. So I set out to find out if the sentiment is true, and if so, is there anything I can do about it? It is predicted that 306 billion emails are going to be sent and received in 2020, and this figure is set to increase year on year, and the prediction is made before the pandemic. And 20% of that traffic are emails sent and received in higher education. So it seems that a large volumes of emails are being sent and received at our institutions and students made up most of our institutions, so it seems that perhaps it's not reasonable to say students generally don't read emails. A better question could be that why your emails are not read. Better still, if any and what are the possibilities of teaching practice-based postgraduate art and design via emails? And the stakeholders are Postgraduate students, course administrators, course leaders, program directors, education developers, to senior and executive academic directors. But I think it is more important to understand the power of influence amongst the stakeholders. As you can see in the diagram here, students have the least decision power in how the curriculum is designed, how the course communication is delivered, and how they are being assessed, and the percentage of contact time they have with staff. So perhaps when you would like to see the behavior change among this body of people, it is not useful nor fair to allocate them the sole burden of change. Since students have the least power on how the course is communicated, how the teaching is conducted, I believe the focus of my research project should be on how to change the expectations and imaginations of those with more power, such as the tutors, the curriculum designers, the budget holders, the policy makers, people like you. The reason I think the project is important is not merely the novelty of using an overlooked medium to teach, nor I suggest it's a good idea to change all of our teaching and transform them onto emails. Digital technology is becoming part of our teaching and learning on postgraduate courses at art universities. It is worthy of our time and energy to challenge and understand our presumptions and expectations on the relationship we build with other humans while using these tools. With such insights, we could then use our imagination and intuition to build a better teaching and learning experience for all involved. In the time we have together, I would like to share some top-line learnings and reflections on the possibility of using email as a site of teaching and learning. I hope you could find this talk gives you a foundation to begin your own exploration on the topic. Here are some of the key methods used in this small action research project. Here are some of the key presumptions I've discovered. All students have email access at all time. This implies they have access to a network communication device and access to internet at all time. Students do not have competing professional, personal and care obligations while they're on the course. Students do not have as accessibility issues that prevent them accessing emails and this content, so they can, can capture all the information required for an action anticipated by the sender of an email. Staff has instant access to emails during office hours and days and choose not to respond to you. Staff have capacity to read all the email chains below your email. Staff would immediately understand why they're CC'd and BCC'd without explanation from you. Staff has same boundaries as you are when it comes to emailing on and during out of our office and days. My documentary research confirms that the email as a site of learning in arts and design higher education is underutilized and unimaginative. Belanded learning rarely position themselves from the perspective of the learner and is often a spectator sport. And for authentic learning to occur, learners must be engaged in an inventive and realistic task that provides opportunities for complex collaborative opportunities. I have also discovered that Conservatively, spam email costs academia worldwide $1.1 billion a year, and about 7 tons of carbon dioxide a year is emitted. And these figures do not count emails that that's been cc'd and replied all needlessly. So bearing this in mind, I have designed a small 14-day intervention 
12 postgraduate students from various London-based arts graduate schools participated. By signing up, they have agreed to answer an email around 6 p.m. each day, and the email had only one question. How did your work day go? To this, they're invited to pick a value between minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, 2 as a response. At the end of the 14-day period, they will be given back a documentation of the fluctuations of their assessment. Most of the participants would have a tutorial at the end of the 14 days period. They're invited to use this information to aid their session. Here are some of the top-line learnings. Participants unanimously agree that email intervention was productive towards their ongoing reflective practice as part of their course study. Participants unanimously agree the process revealed vital information on their inner dialogue and attitude on productivity. The four participants out of the 12 that only participated for 10 days expressed the lack of patience for this kind of bi-weekly data reporting. One participant found it hard to see the point at the process of sign-up but participated anyway because it was not a hassle. From surveys and interviews, we have learned that there are some qualities of good practice that we all hold as important when it comes to email communication. And I have conducted a number of surveys and interviews with 13 academic staff from very seniority to understand what they might be. And they are actionable. The information contained in email helps the receiver to move on to the next action and decision that is beneficial individually and mutually. Succinct. Not only the copy, but also the format and the greeting are uncomplicated. Connection. The receiver wants to connect with the sender through the content. They want to feel the sender thought about their needs and well-being between the lines. Acknowledgement. Receiver likes to see good deeds and good news recognized, even though it doesn't concern them. Precise. The information contained it has to be exact. Concise. No prose. Bullet points are the best. So, what have we learned? We have learned that ubiquitous doesn't in equate to inclusive. Just because everybody are expected to have access to email, it doesn't mean they, they can. Emails might feel disposable, but people's times are not. And give respect before you take. You can always co-create and review your communication boundaries with your students and colleagues. Students are not perpetrators of bad email communication on your course. It's not about fixing them alone. Emails have carbon front too. Email exposes cybersecurity risks to both staff and students. And for me, there is definitely an appetite for students to accept email as a site of learning. So as it caused the imagination of the educators to take the lead. And there are a number of limitations on this project, and some of them are listed here. And the project was unfunded, so there are limited time and capacity I could spend on this. However, I do believe the importance of the project, especially given the context of the pandemic. Many of you might find out, as I do, that video conferencing is not a replacement of in-person teaching. We have to really think about all the tools we have and negotiate their position within the interaction hierarchy so that we could use our time and energy wisely and effectively until we meet again in person. The next slide concerns a bibliography and suggested citation for this talk. Thank you for your time and curiosity, and I'm grateful for the platform at Valencia Design Education Forum 2020. I hope you're able to stay safe and healthy wherever you are. Thank you.